Hey everyone. Um, so there was already an introduction for me a little bit. Um, it's always weird to see a video recording of yourself. Um, but anyways, I am Michael and I'm going to be talking about air handling in Nuxt 3. And this is an excerpt from the Mastering Nuxt 3 course. So it's nice that um, my talk here is following Maya's because testing and air handling go hand in hand in helping to improve the reliability of your application. And it wasn't planned, but I think both of us were using the same uh, keynote theme. So that's kind of funny. Um, so a bit about myself, if you don't know, um, I am the Mastering Nuxt 3 instructor, as we have mentioned several times already. And I am a uh, full-time Vue educator. I've written articles for Vue Mastery and Vue School. I also have a weekly newsletter that comes out on Wednesday mornings where I share Vue tips and tricks and articles and things like that. I have a book, uh, a collection of different Vue tips if you're interested in that kind of thing. And I've also got a couple different courses that I've released on my own, such as Clean Components and Reusable Components. And of course, I have my own website where I have all of that stuff that lives there. And there are some articles on there as well. If you want to connect with me, I'm on Twitter. That's the platform where I am mostly on. Don't really do social media other than Twitter. Um, but yeah, you can come uh, hit me up there if you want to chat. Uh, that's where I'll be the most responsive if you want to ask me a question or, you know, uh, see what I'm up to. So enough about me. Let's get back into the meat of this topic, which is air handling in Nuxt. So mastering Nuxt 3 has a bunch of different lessons in a bunch of different chapters. And as I had mentioned in the uh, promo video just before this talk, We've been releasing lessons, um, you know, every single week as we've finished recording them and and polishing them up. And so at this point, we're nearing the end of the course, and it's looking like we're going to be around eighty or more lessons, um, depending on how um, the next couple chapters play out. But the talk that I am giving today is in chapter three, where we're going to talk about client-side errors with Nuxt error boundary. So this whole chapter, chapter three, is on making our app robust. And that includes TypeScript and some error handling. So the reason for error handling is that end users are unpredictable. And the thing is that when we're developing apps, Maybe you're trying to um, put together a feature where you click a button and it opens a modal. Well, at least in my experience, I find that I end up doing that, that same happy path dozens, maybe even hundreds of times throughout the day. You click the button, it works. You click the button, it doesn't work. You change something, you click the button, the modal opens. And so we kind of like drill the expected behavior of this application into our brains. We know exactly how it works because we wrote the code and we see the code and we know exactly how all the different features of the app are supposed to work. But the problem is that our users don't know this. And once we put our app out into the wild and all sorts of different people with different backgrounds and different expectations start to use our application, you know, anything can happen, anything at all. And it's not just our end users. It's the, the conditions of the network. As we have seen today, networks and the internet can be unreliable. Sometimes you have a slow internet connection, and there's nothing you can do about it. And so we need to not only write tests so that our code works, but have error handling so that when things that are outside of our control go all wonky, we've got errors where we, ha we handle those errors so that um, instead of our app just crashing and burning into a 
fiery wreck, we can recover from those errors and our users can continue to use the application as it was intended. And this is why we need error handling. So now I'm going to jump into some code. So because we're already in chapter three at this point, we've built out some of the app that we build in the course. So I'm gonna take a moment to explain what's going on here so you have a bit more context into how we're going to add in our error handling. So we're building out an online course platform. It's a little bit meta, I know, but it I think it was a good idea and I in, have enjoyed building out this online course platform. So what we've got here is a header that displays the title of the course. And then on the left-hand side here, we've got the navigation, which lets us go between the different chapters and lessons in our application. And you'll see on the right-hand side here, this is where the actual lesson content lives. We've got a header, we've got a video in most of the lessons, and then we've got a text description underneath that. The other interesting feature that we've got so far is this button here that lets us complete a lesson so we can track our progress as we go through the course. At this point in the course, this button is only stored in local storage, but later on in the course, we actually hook this up to a database where we use Supabase as the database, but we use Prisma so that we can get a type safe connection and uh, we get Prisma to generate all the types for us. So everything is uh, neat and tidy. So that's how the app works. Now let's take a little bit of uh, a look at what the code is doing. Oh, before I, before I do that, I wanna point out that we're doing uh, some child routing here or nested routing. And so the key thing to think about is that when we go between different lessons, the only thing that changes is this pane here on the right-hand side. This header and the nav does not change with the exception of the, the highlighting of the, of the link here, of course. So the only thing that changes here is this, uh, this pane here. And so we can do child routing to, to keep this as one component. And then as we go between different lessons, we just swap out the component that lives here. And so that's, that's basically what nested routing gives us. Now, I'm not sure if you can see in the stream or not, and I don't really have a good way of uh, zooming in here, but at the, this uh, URL here, we've got slash course, and that's the, the route that renders this outer shell here. Then the rest of the route is responsible for getting us to the specific chapter and then the specific lesson that we're interested in uh, interested in taking. So this is important because of how we write our code to match that route. If we take a look at our pages directory, we're using the file-based routing system that Nuxt comes with. The slash course route, as I mentioned before, it matches to this course component here, course.view. And this component renders out our header at the top. Then we have got our nav on the left-hand side that renders out the different chapters and lessons. And then at the bottom, we've got this Nuxt page here that's rendered out. And this is where the rest of the route gets rendered.
So if we take a look at our directory structure here again, we can see that we're at uh, slash course slash chapter. And then we've got the chapter slug here, which has got square brackets around it, slash lesson. And then finally, the component inside of it is named lesson slug with square brackets again. And so it's kind of a mouthful to explain uh, this route here. But hopefully you can see in the stream that this um, this route matches the route that we are, are using in our application over here. So we've got the course, and then the chapter, and then the chapter slug, and then lesson, and then the lesson slug. And so these square brackets here let us dynamically change between the different chapters and lessons. So lesson slug is then rendered inside that uh, part on the right. And this component is pretty straightforward. We render the lesson out and render the video player, as well as this lesson complete button at the bottom, which lets us toggle our completion. So now that we understand where we're at, we understand the code that we're working with, and we understand how we've set up our routing and we're doing some child routing here. Now let's get into error handling. So Nuxt comes with this Nuxt error boundary component. Just let me zoom in for a second here. And this Nuxt error boundary component, it works very similarly to a try catch block. So if you've got some JavaScript code that might throw an error, you, you put it inside of a try catch block. And if that code throws an error, then you're able to catch that error and then handle it properly without it blowing up the rest of your application. And that's exactly what the Nuxt error boundary component does for us. The component that we want to put inside of that try catch, we put it inside of the default slot of the Nuxt error boundary component. And if that component has an error during its rendering or anything else, then that error will be caught by the Nuxt error boundary. So to see this in action, we're going to um, we're going to break our app on purpose. And whenever we click on this button here, we're going to throw an error. So we're using the create error method that comes with Nuxt3. And this is a, a utility method that um, lets us create errors and throw them at, on the client side as well as the server side. And it's the same method uh, regardless of which environment we're in, which makes it really handy and uh, really convenient. So if I make sure that we've saved that there, I'll open up my dev tools here. If I go and click on this button, we'll see that we have this error being logged out to our console. Now, this isn't great because it doesn't give the user any feedback as to what's going on. There's no way to recover from this error. We're just silently failing. And this is definitely suboptimal. So we are going to use Nuxt error boundary. But instead of putting it in the lesson slug component, we're actually going to put it in the course component here. And we're going to wrap it around that child route. In this way, we're able to make sure that anything, any error that happens in that child route will be caught. So now that we've added that in, I'll clear out my console here. And now if I hit this button, you'll notice two things happen. The first thing is 
the most obvious thing. And it's that this thing over here, this component disappeared entirely. And the second is that nothing is logged to the console. And the reason for that, the reason for both of those is that next error boundary, when it encounters an error, it catches it. So we're no longer logging it out to the console because the component has caught it. And the reason that this lesson disappeared here is that next error boundary switches from rendering what's in the default slot here and instead will render the named error slot if we have provided it. So we can provide that slot. In a generic error message, because why not? Now we see that instead of rendering the next page, next error boundary is rendering out our error message. So this lets us render out um, if we've got a custom error message or anything like that, we can put that in there. We can, you know, put a funny graphic or, you know, whatever we want. We can also access the error object itself through this uh, scope here. And this way, we're able to get more details about the error if we want to provide that to the user or use that to decide what kind of error message we're showing or something like that. And this error value is a ref itself. So we have to uh, grab it using a value there. And then we save, and we can see that on our lesson here, we have the error rendered out. But showing the or showing showing an error message is the first part of the puzzle. the The second part is actually recovering from that error. We need to recover so that our our user can continue to use the application because it's not really that useful for us to see, oh, that's it's broken, okay, but now what? And recovering from or resetting the error in uh, or with Nux error boundary is, very straightforward because this error ref here, uh, we're depending on the value of this error ref. So all that we need to do is to set the value of this error ref to null, and next error boundary will go back to its normal state. So let me put in a button here. And GitHub Copilot got it very wrong. So I'll just write that there. Close enough. So we have this reset button now. And if I click on it, we're back to our working state. But that's only one part of the, the, the puzzle here. Because when we have an error, there's a reason for that error. And so we need to make sure that we actually solve that underlying error before we reset. Because if the error was with the component itself, it could be the case that just retrying and re-rendering that component would solve the error. But it could also be that we would just get that error thrown again and again and again. And so we get stuck in this infinite loop of doom where we cannot escape our errors. So that's the next step, which I won't be able to cover in this talk, unfortunately. But this, that next step is to figure out how do we resolve this error? And so before I finish up with Nuxt error boundary, I want to touch on where we might want to use this component and, and why it's better than just um, a try catch block. And so in my mind, the the benefit of a Nuxt error boundary like this is that we can isolate errors in specific parts of our application. Without Nuxt error boundary like this, we have to throw up a generic error message and 
give the user a generic way of resolving that error, which is usually just you know a, a full page refresh because what else can we do? If we don't know what the error is or what it might be, there's not a lot that we can do to help the user out. But if we put the error around specific places, for example, when we load a lesson, we can be pretty sure that it might be that we couldn't load the lesson data or the video player broke. And so we can have a, a much better sense of what the errors are and how to recover from them. So that's the end of my demo. And now is the part where I promote myself a little bit before we, f we completely wrap up. And so I did mention I had a book. And if you are interested in it, you can find it on my website. If you want to Google view tips, you'll probably find it in that first page of the search results. And as has been mentioned many times already, um, Mastering Nux 3 is 30% off. I know you just heard me say it just before my talk in that pre-recorded video, but you know these are the slides that I prepared, so I'm just going to go through it. And there's the code, VueNation2023, extra $15 off. And that's it for me. Oh, yeah, my website is michaelntson.com. And I am at Michael Thiessen on Twitter. Thank you, Michael. And I love that you promoted it as well, because I just started taking the course and I'm like, this is really dope. Like people need to do this. Thank you. So Thank you. I am glad that you are promoting it. And now does your book, is it uh, online as like, can you get a PDF version or is it only a physical book? Yeah, so it's a it's a PDF ebook if you want it that way. There's also okay. a hardcover, and I also there's an option if you want to have the different tips emailed to you, um, just sort of like a you know have it show up in your inbox. So this is good to know. I am incredibly dyslexic, so I learn best from. This is totally not your book, but I uh, listen to the book. And then I take notes in the book. So now I just have to get your, both versions of your book. So that Maybe way I, I have get... to do an audio version of it, you know? Ooh, yes, yes. Put it on the to-do list, right? Not like you have enough going on. <laughs> okay, question number one. Windows or Mac or other? I am on Mac. Ooh, We've always gotten like everybody, I think, today or today and yesterday have always been, you know, either both or Mac. So I dig it. All right. Are there any other scenarios where accounting for errors is a good option? Um, accounting for errors. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this question is getting at. Um maybe where we could use errors for something else to be able to help troubleshoot. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Cause it also could be like, are they looking for logs or something? Hmm. Yeah. So in this talk, I, I um, was mostly focused on client side error handling, but there's also server side error handling because, mm -hmm. you know, bad things happen also on the server. And, yeah, I I don't know how else to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. We'll move to the next one. How can you test error handling in a Nuxt application? Yeah, so I don't have a specific answer for this beyond um, you can write tests. You can write unit tests that um, will check to see if that Nuxt error boundary has been triggered and that the the error message that you're expecting is shown so you can mm -hmm. deliberately put it into a broken state and then check to see does that error message show up in that spot that you expected um and so maya showed a bit about how how you can do that with vtest 
I, I feel like this, uh, your answer and Maya's definitely like led to this question. Are there any techniques to log and track errors in a Next application? And I like what you just said of like, you know, breaking it to check it. <laughs> are there any other techniques? Yeah. So um, logging and uh, telemetry stuff is always really good. There are things like um, rule bar and um blog rocket and like there's so many different um logging providers that are pretty easy to integrate most of the time and um they're great because you know if an error happens on your server you have the logs that you can look at but if it happens on someone else's machine you have no idea what's going on there and so these services make it easy to uh track if errors happen and where they happen and so you can get data of on on what's going on thank you and uh what's the hardest part of handling errors correctly yeah it's i think the hardest part is doing it thoroughly and figuring out where errors might happen uh I, it's sort of like testing in that way you have to put on a different mindset of of uh, you're not developing the code anymore you're like actively trying to break it and and so it's a I think a mindset shift to to think about about your code in a different way like that thank you and uh, what's the difference between uh, lesson well Brett square brackets lesson slug dot view and underscore lesson slug dot view. I don't know the underscore syntax, but the square brackets is a dynamic segment. And so that means that um, it becomes a route parameter. So you can grab lesson slug inside of your component. OK. Um, shouldn't we just let an application crash in this case as best practice? Yeah, I think there are certainly cases where it's better to just have the, the thing crash entirely. Um, I'm not sure what the best um, the best practice there is to as to where when you do that and when you try and handle the error. But um, yeah, certainly that is something to think about. My dog is howling in the background, so I'm hoping she stops. <laughs> All right. So, and how would you handle an HTTP error types? Yeah. So if you're in the browser on the client side and you're making um, calls to your server or other servers, um, I would I would put that in a try catch block um, similar to the next bound, error boundary. And then you can handle those errors if they come up. Thank you. And how about, do you have any tips on how to best catch REST API errors? Yeah, I think this was the same as the last one. OK, I just wanted to make sure yeah. that it wasn't like something different specifically for REST APIs. You never know, like especially changing the other, uh, other types of it, that it's always good to double check. And how do you find the line between handling out errors and letting them crash philosophy? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I'm not really I don't I don't know what my philosophy is on this one. I haven't uh, thought about it enough, but definitely um, something I should think about a bit more about when it's important to handle the errors versus um, letting the the application crash. I think, the first thing that comes to mind would be if whether or not it's critical um, critical behavior. So, like for example, on on Twitter, let's say if you can't load the news feed, then like what's the point of Twitter, right? So that's kind of like a let's you know have a fatal crash. Um, if you can't log in the user, then that's kind of a, a similar thing. Um, but if it's that, you know, the 
some specific thing on the explore page doesn't work quite right, then maybe you can just, you know, put that into a, an error message and like 95% of the app is working correctly. So just, you know, keep going. Um, and then you can, you can handle that error on its own and it doesn't have to blow up the whole thing just because that one little piece isn't working. I think that's a great example. Uh, it reminds me of when Twitter spaces went offline. That wasn't really a crash. That was a decision, but they let the rest of the app still work. So um, I think that's a great way of making it more realistic uh, example. Now, I know that we went through a few questions and you have, uh, what would you want everyone to know about mastering Nux is like your go-to thing of like, this is the coolest feature. Oh, about, uh, yeah. What my favorite feature is with in Nux. Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll go um, with that. Yeah. Oh, it's really hard. I think my favorite feature is, um, I don't know if this is a good answer, but my favorite feature is the, the team behind it um, because I feel like there are already so many features in Nux that are pretty impressive. And um, even it, it's made creating Mastering Nux 3 very difficult because I can't talk about everything. I can't teach everything. Otherwise, we'd have like a 50 hour long course and no <laughs> one's going to do that and so it's been hard to like try and figure out what the important parts are and um only focus on those but there's so much in there and i feel like every week or two there's like an announcement of a new feature that's been added or you know experimental support for this new thing that's going to come down the line and um yeah it's really exciting and i'm yeah, I, I think it's a great, uh, a great platform, and so that would be my answer, my like non-answer. It. <laughs> it it still works. It still works. Like there's so many options. How do you choose one? So I totally get that. And thank you, Michael, for joining us today. And yes, everyone, check out Mastering Nux, Michael's new book. And one more time, what is your Twitter again? Is it just I don't uh, know Michael Tyson? Okay, that's what I thought it was, but I'm like, now I don't remember if there was an extra letter. So thank you again, Michael.